To understand the plot, you really only need a few things. A little bit of patience, a highlighter, maybe some sticky tabs, and a dump truck of LSD. Alrighty, welcome back. You're watching Waste Mailing List and I'm your host Seth. If you're back for round two, thanks for being a repeat customer. And if this is your first time dropping by my little creative project, welcome. It's great to have you. Before I get stuck into the focus of today's episode, I really just want to take a couple minutes out to address the response to my previous video, as well as offer some clarity for what my plans are for the channel moving forward. If that's not something you're interested in, no problem. Just scrub forward ahead to the next section. I really just want to express my gratitude to everyone who took the time out to watch my first video on the melancholy of resistance. The response I got to that was incredibly gracious and supportive and it truly meant the world to me that so many of you took time out to watch, comment, engage with it. It was just a wonderful response and I really appreciate all of that. If you haven't seen it yet, I'll pop a link right there. Look, it's 45 minutes, but I promise at least five of them are good. Taking into account the feedback that I got in response to the Melancholy video, I'm going to do a few things to help refine the content of this channel into a more accommodating experience. First off, I've pulled the audio from this episode and uploaded it onto Anchor FM, where you'll be able to listen to it along with any future Waste Mailing List episodes. So if you're the type of person who would rather listen on the go rather than watch, totally understand. I've got you. There's a link right down in the description box below. You'll just have to forgive the lapel mic quality audio that will be buzzing through those AirPods of yours. At least for now, until I, you know, upgrade my hardware. On the flip side, if you're a reader rather than a watcher, I've also uploaded the text transcripts onto Substack, including all the references and links to where I draw the information from for each episode. If you check the link below, you will already find the transcript for today's video is up there. It's very early days, so my plans for the channel are really still in the gestational stage. Here's what I can say with a reasonable degree of confidence. Booktube is a very crowded community, and I really want to fill a gap that I've seen so far. There just aren't enough people in this space doing deep dives, and that's where I want to focus my efforts. I'm talking 30, 60, 90 minute exhaustive analysis of works with high literary or conceptual merit. I may choose to break each book into several shorter videos down the track, but I'm still kind of looking at what the delivery of that will look like, so bear with me for now. I'm also going to do my best to focus on works that haven't already been beaten to death by the booktube community, so you can expect reasonably fringe novels to be the rule rather than the exception here. In terms of posting frequency, I'm going to keep the bar for output fairly low for the time being. It takes me quite a little while to read a book, compose my thoughts on it, write all my notes for an episode, record it, edit it, and so on and so forth. And I just don't want to feel like I'm forced to churn out content super regularly and, you know, lose the passion for the project. So as it gets smoother with the whole process, I would like to release videos more often. But for the time being, I'm just going to ask you to be patient. All right, let's get to why we're all here. Animal Money by Michael Sisko. As I'm sure my channel name and constant references to the author make clear, I'm something of a pension fanatic. Pension readers in my personal life are few and far between, to say the least, so I often find myself posting these overwrought, paranoid word spirals into the pension subreddit. Last year, when I was feverishly coming off the back end of Gravity's Rainbow, I was trawling through that subreddit looking for recommendations of other books that could scratch that same genre-defying, high-density itch. Various members of the community, they name drop the usual people you would expect to be compared to Pynchon. You know, Gaddis, Gas, Barth, McElroy, those types, right? But there was one name, one name who kept getting mentioned who I had never heard of, let alone read. Michael Sisko, and the same evocative title kept being mentioned as well. You guessed it, Animal Money. A quick Google search of that name returned this image, and my immediate guttural response was, I have no idea what this is, and I must have it. Oh, and uh, don't worry, we'll be getting back to that cover soon. While much of Sisko's back catalog is not currently in print, Animal Money still appears to be in circulation. Sadly, the 
only way for me to get my hands on it in Australia was to feed the Amazon machine. I know, I know. Don't worry. I'll be saving my 10 Hail Marys in self-flagellation for after I'm done recording the video. Suffice it to say, after a week's worth of shipping updates, this psychedelic brick showed up at my doorstep and I have been singularly immersed in it for the last fortnight. So let's start with the question that I'm sure a few of you are asking yourselves. Who the hell is Michael Sisko? Born a Glendale, California denizen in the 1970s, Michael Sisko is one of the formative tastemakers in weird fiction. He earned his bachelor's degree from Sarah Lawrence University, his master's from Buffalo State, and I think I've got this right, his PhD from NYU. Did you know I'm also his publicist? If you're looking for him now, you'll find him instructing at the English department at CUNY, which, out of pure autofictional convenience, happens to be where one of his narrators in Animal Money, Ronald Crest, also teaches at. He burst onto the alternative American literary scene with his debut novel, The Divinity Student, which came to the attention of Anne Vandermeer. Yes, as in that Anne and Jeff Vandermeer. He cold called her with a manuscript and a referral letter from none other than Thomas Ligotti. Trusting Ligotti's tastes, she gave it a read and was immediately compelled to publish it. She would later go on to write the introduction for the novel, which is uncoincidentally where I'm drawing all the information for this from. <laughs> Just as a quick side note, The Divinity Student is currently out of print and I am dying to get my hands on a copy. So if anyone watching this knows who I can get one for, you know, under 500 USD, I would love to. So get in touch. You know where to find me. Following this well-positioned cold call, Cisco went on to publish 12 novels, one of which is coming out this year. On top of that, he's penned some stunning translations of Julio Cortazar and Marcel Bielu. One piece of work of his that I'd like to champion, which doesn't get nearly enough attention, is his commentary of Kafka's Zurao aphorisms. Kafka tends to get all the credit for, you know, his novels, but I truly think his heart was in his short stories, his letters, his aphorisms. And the Zurao aphorisms is a fairly abstract text to parse, but he provides this blow-by-blow, -blow, section by section commentary filled with pathos and wit. If you are at all interested in that text, I highly encourage you to seek it out. I'll drop a link in the description box below. You know, for the five of you who are actually interested in it. So, Animal Money was published under the now-defunct niche imprint Lazy Fascist Press, which is a subsidiary of the still-active Eraserhead Press. LFP operated between 2010 and 2017 as a patron of weird and bizarre fiction. The press was founded, managed, and edited by the then 22-year-old Cameron Pierce, who, over its seven-year tenure, published over 60 novels. And one of those novels in 2015 was Cisco's longest and arguably most twisted work to date. You guessed it. Another one of the big names to springboard out of LFP is Stephen Graham Jones, who's written a number of bookstagram darlings over the past couple of years. This is a digression if there ever was one, but seriously, that name, Lazy Fascist Press, how good is that? Pierce founded the press in Portland, Oregon at a time when a particularly insufferable brand of armchair slacktivist and nationalistic ideologues were gaining traction in the Pacific Northwest. He named his creative project as a sort of tongue-in-cheek jab against these type of people. But the humor behind it ultimately soured because, obviously, in the events after 2016, a particularly violent, threatening arm of fascist ideology began to rise up, and it just didn't ring the same way after that. He considered changing the name a couple of times, but in 2017 it became something of a moot point. Pierce chose to close the imprint for a number of reasons. Notably, the economic and practical challenges of scaling an operation, a disillusionment toward Amazon's stranglehold over the entire publishing industry, and just a desire to commit himself more fully to his own writing. It's a shame to see them go, because Pierce was giving a platform to some incredibly bold, experimental, daring writers, some of the best in the Northern Hemisphere. But I also understand his decision to want to give the press a clean break. As for Pierce himself, his social media presence has been mostly quiet for the past few years. Last I heard, he was running a craft brewery up in Portland. I hope he's doing well for himself. Let's start with the epigraph. I've always been fascinated by writer's use of an epigraph to not only give you some idea of where they draw influence from, but also act as a sort of Rosetta Stone to unlock some deeper meaning about the work. The epigraph reads, 
That bird is free. You owe me a bird. Keep that line in mind as we move through this video. I'll be circling back to it later. This 800 page novel is broken down into 13 delirious, contradictory titled sections. Black albinos, in for questioning. Non-smoking smokers, my personal favorite. The situation, in for questioning. Broke bankers, they beg for mercy while they're killing you. Fond memories of terror, drunk with sobriety. None of this is real. Discount riches, prison roads, living skeletons, elderly drones. Following these 13 parts, there's also two unnumbered sections simply titled Myrtle and Pages of No Narration. Both of those exist in the last 10 pages of the book. Within these 13 numbered sections, the narrative is broken down into what I'd be tempted to call vignettes, each of which is separated by a dinkus. Yes, the word for the little dots that separate pages at a paragraph break is called a dinkus. I'm not happy about it either. It actually reminded me a lot of the seven sprockets you see that separate each chapter in Gravity's Rainbow. And if you're wondering, no, that will not be the last Gravity's Rainbow comparison I make here. The novel is written from an ever-changing perspective that shifts across first, second, and third person narration, adding to this nauseating sense of disorientation. One moment, you'll be fed through the first person perspective of an unnamed narrator, only to flip over to a new one at the page break without even realizing it. It becomes something of a puzzle to try and keep track of who's talking at any given moment, and you mostly need to do that through deduction based on who's being referenced and in which tense. Now if that sounds complex, strap in, because we're about to get to the plot. Okay, I guess I can't avoid this section forever. I'm going to do my very best to nut out exactly what happened in this novel, because I'm going to be honest, the plot is absolutely Byzantine. The novel opens at an economics conference in the fictional South American city of San Torabio. We start with the first-person perspective of Professor Ronald Crest, an economics instructor at CUNY, who is immediately struck unconscious by blunt force trauma to the head and starts the narration from the comfort of a hospital bed. While incapacitated, he also learns of four other economists from other prestigious universities who coincidentally are also stricken by various ailments and injuries to the skull. We have Professor Long, who lacerates her ear while rolling over broken glass in bed. Professor Abwi, who suffers from a sudden intense attack of vertigo. Professor Budsha, who dislocates his jaw after a run-in with an avocado stone. And finally, a second Professor Long, who goes into anaphylactic shock after a bee sting to the cheek. Yes, another Professor Long. Really, Michael? This wasn't complex enough as is? Come on, man. The circumstances behind their highly coincidental injuries are never fully explained, but it provides a nice moment for the five of them to come together, which is critical to the development of the narrative that follows. Having missed the economics conference, the five of them decide to host a little mini-conference of their own, sharing their papers and presentations among each other. And in the exchange of ideas, a new concept arises. In the crisscross of our conversation, the idea of animal money appears. None of us can account for it. None of us can take credit for it. The idea silences us for a while as we try to grasp it, each within ourselves. It really is only a chance coupling of two words, but they seem to call to each other. It is not immediately obvious to us that animal money does not refer to the age-old practice of raiding wealth in head of cattle or otherwise using livestock as money. There is something new in our minds. Here, we see the genesis of the idea that drives obfuscates and eventually disintegrates the entirety of the narrative. The concept is given additional weight when the five of them realize they all have shared experiences of recently encountering animals engaging in forms of currency, barter, and trade. You've got squirrels exchanging colorful sequins for acorns. You've got cardinals paying crows for protection. You've got chickens acting out the last will and testament of their fallen companion. Each one of these economists has their own story. Perhaps these observations of ours subtly goaded us toward the chimerically portentous phrase, animal money. But what really seems important in the concept itself, if it is a concept at all, is that animal money would be animal, not just money used by animals. Alive, to put it briefly. The five then spend a prolonged series of time trying to determine the practicalities of how this new economy, based on living currency, will function. 
The concept gets highly theoretical and abstract to the point where even in the first 30 pages, I already began to lose my sense of control over the narrative. And I know what you might be thinking, how bad could it be, right? This bad. Animal money metabolism would be completely stable. It would not be completely stable. It would involve boom and bust, inflation, recession, like famines and epidemics in a population. The money might inbreed, and the various species would vary in relation to each other, so that in the proximity of one species, another would physically diminish, either shrinking or losing tangible substance, becoming phantom-like. Picture that for 800 pages. Suffice it to say, these five economists become enamored with this idea and work on the way in which they will develop the currency and release it into the global economy. As with any new radical idea, their creation, animal money, is met with intense opposition by the nebulous, shadowy powers that oversee life in San Torbio. See, these economists are all members of a collective known as the IEI, the International Economics Institute, which governs all the activities, the dissemination of information, and the research that goes on in the wider economic community. A hazy conspiracy begins to form as these five begin to suspect they're being followed, undermined, and ultimately threatened for trying to instigate this change into the financial status quo. Their paranoia reaches a point of confirmation when one of them ends up dead. As a war begins to break out between these revolutionaries and those who oppose them, the fabric of the natural world begins to fray and the story becomes more fractured, delirious, surreal, and fantasic. Any semblance of a conventional narrative is just buried under dozens of hallucinogenic set pieces. We're talking zoos hidden in universities, economic monasteries hidden in the South American mountains, interplanetary spacecraft. This novel goes out there, literally and figuratively. Now, I'm not going to give you a blow-by-blow -blow of the entirety of this plot, mostly out of interest in preserving my own sanity, as well as the practical choice of not wanting this video to be four hours long. <laughs> Suffice it to say, Animal Money is not friendly to a passive reading experience. Between its polyphonic narrators, its non-chronological timelines, yes, I said timelines, plural, as well as its increasingly entropic structure, I promise you, you will get lost if you're not giving it your complete and undivided attention. And even if you are, you'll probably lose track of it at some point anyway. I know I did, but that's okay. It's not impossible to wrap your head around it. To understand the plot, you really only need a few things. A little bit of patience, a highlighter, maybe some sticky tabs, and a dump truck of LSD. While the plot is a riot on its own terms, I really think the substance of the novel is found in its themes and its subversions of conventional genre and structure. I'm sure the concept of the invisible hand shouldn't be too distant for most of you. As a brief recap, it's attributed to the 18th century Scottish philosopher Adam Smith, who proposed this idea of the unseen mechanisms that drive the movement of finances in a free market economy. A complex interplay of individual economic pressures, all guided by, you guessed it, an invisible hand. And Cisco does something quite interesting with this concept by literalizing what is normally accepted to be a metaphorical term. When people communicate the idea of the invisible hand, they tend to do so in an abstract sense. There's no actual invisible hands feeding money through ATMs and into circulation, or is there? Here, Cisco employs repeated use of hand imagery, which actually has measurable effects on the plot. Let me give you an example. Right here, you have my closed hand. Next trick, there, the pointer. Keeping my hand like this, like wood, I bring it up and turn and swing my hand around down the end of my uplifted arm where I point. A building appears, like honeycomb in the night, with a flick of the lights. Hmm, turn. Now, point in the other direction and flick on another building. Sequences like this recur all throughout the plot, almost as a sort of leitmotif. Let me give you another example which pops up in part 11. We are now sharp-edged shadows towering over San Torabio. We squat or recline behind the city, combing its golden traffic streams, reaching out our void arms to make adjustments to the city like a luminous sand painting, mixing in dully glowing ash and tiny vibrant embers. We aren't controlling the city, we're adjusting it. 
As the novel progresses, we see this collapse of the metaphorical into the literal as abstract economic concepts like the invisible hand become palpable, appreciable influences on the plot, the characters, the environment. Economic forces may govern global exchange behavior, but what if they had actual functional influences on the natural world like weather or climate change? In my reading, Cisco is provoking a discussion on the limits of our collective agreements. Have we come to believe so strongly in an idea, say the idea of the free market economy, that it ceases to be an abstract concept and starts to become a physically affecting force? This is just scratching the surface of the largest force that has an influence over San Torbio, and indeed the larger world of the book. The Invisible Hand is really just one of the earliest instances of a concept that would later be referred to as economic mysticism, which is taken to the nth degree in animal money. Think of it as a sort of belief structure where we hope, we pray, at worst we actually believe that all the checks and balances of the free market economy will square and shared prosperity will come to all of us so long as we remain fiscally responsible citizens. What a load of shit. We place an unwavering faith, and yes, I use faith in the religious sense of the word, in a financial system that is flimsy, tenuous, deeply corrupt. A system that allowed widespread economic catastrophe to occur, exclusively due to industry malfeasance. I refer, of course, to the global financial crisis of 2007. Cisco was writing this novel in the years directly following the GFC, when the country was still reeling from its after effects. I asked Michael on Twitter if the GFC played into his thinking when he was writing, and this is what he had to say. Most definitely, the crisis demonstrated that economics was just a branch of fantasy. Fantasy, mysticism, financial voodoo. Cisco places these ideas center stage by creating a literalization of what is generally believed to be an abstract concept. You may recall those five economists with whom the story started. They exist in a sort of alternate reality where the business of economics probably isn't the image you have in your head. What are you thinking? Crisply starched shirts, paneled cubicles, a nine to five at a desk? No, no. These people are more cult-like in their day-to-day -day activities. They speak to each other in these coded phrases. A commonly repeated phrase is, the sure fit is one. They all dress in these featureless, colorless robes. They all have these facial markings in the shape of mathematical symbols. They spend their mornings and evenings performing these bizarre rituals like separating beads and filling in answers in a test book. Cisco never explicitly states the reason for these strange behaviors, and I don't think he needs to. He takes the reader's intelligence seriously and provides us the latitude to explore our own personal interpretations. Let me offer one of my own. These character flourishes function almost just as texture to the concept that our belief in the sturdiness of our economy is religious, almost cult-like. An unshakable faith in these mystical ones and zeros traveling down fiber optic cabling at light speed. It's an on-the-nose criticism, but a biting one nonetheless. He doesn't need to pen a 5,000 word Harper's essay to get his point across. He just needs to dress the boring up in absurd to show us how absurd it was to begin with. You don't find reality by divesting yourself of fantasies. And that's not because that's a fantasy too. A divestment of fantasy fantasy. It's because the fantasies are street level. A one-way street. You can't have just fantasy. It's not the ghoulish mirror. It all begins under the streets and goes all the way up to heaven like Roman title deeds. There's a reason that money power world is so gray and boring and replete with repellencies. Because it's advantageous to the fantasizers of a certain class to promulgate the idea that there's a Walter Mitty gulf between the money world and the fantasy world. That money isn't a fantasy. Fantasy is over there. Not here. Never here. Take that barrier out, and you see the magic in the money. This reminds me so closely of what Michael Lewis exposed in The Big Short. A financial system whose representatives dress their work up in a veneer of complexity and impenetrability so that you think you couldn't possibly do what they do. Which is fucking ridiculous, because any old schmuck can understand how a collateralized debt obligation works so long as the person explaining it to you has the common decency to wipe away the codified language. It's all buzzwords and inside jokes with these people. A cult of cufflinks and wingtip shoes.
The economy is a fantasy that we all agreed to buy into. And any time someone proposes a radical new idea to upend our capitalistic structure, the powers that be silence, oppress, and obfuscate it. Say, for example, a new living form of currency. The code of the economist is a poetics. There's a magic world, but you can't ever have it unless you buy an expensive approximation of it for your estate from participating retailers. And if you can't manage to wrangle that, you're just stuck in a bad world where all the failures live. Kind of. You're a bad person. Their fantasy world song? They camouflage it treacherously as the dullest, most boring fantasy doldrum TV news so that people won't recognize it for what it is. A song. A lousy song. And start singing it for themselves. Sing a world for them. Because any asshole can sing. Maybe. Just maybe. Our reality is starting to look like a fantasy after all. Or rather, revealing the fantasy it was built upon in the first place. As far as I'm concerned, hysterical realism, the genre that animal money treads in, is the perfect medium to explore this idea in. And look, even if you're not interested in a deeper reading of it, it's still a wild ride to travel from one fantastic set piece to the next. Anyone who's had their ear to the ground over the past few years should probably be aware of our culture's shifting attitudes toward work and career. And I think this headspace provides an interesting framework to approach animal money. There's a character who's introduced fairly early on. They're never given a name, they just go by the moniker Super Aesop, who becomes progressively more central to the story as the plot carries forward. From where I'm sitting, Super Aesop is not only the most interesting character in the book, but also the novel's clearest protagonist. Our initial encounter with him is at a job interview for a zoo in the first section titled In for Questioning. As a quick aside, how good is that title? The comparison between a job interview and an interrogation is just so spot on, and it only gets better from there. Cisco delivers this five-page sequence of rapid-fire, ridiculously pedantic corporate questioning. Let me give you a feel for it. Why did you leave your last job? Can you do this job? Why do you feel you're qualified for this job? Would you be able, in a safe manner, to carry out all the job assignments associated with this position? Are you able to perform this job's duties with reasonable accommodations to them? The duties? Can you lift 50 pounds and carry it 50 yards? Can you lift 75 pounds and carry it 50 yards? Can you lift 50 pounds and carry it 75 yards? And this goes on and on for pages on end. Just dozens of ridiculously pedantic micromanaging questions. And Super Aesop's answers are just so deliciously satisfying. My chief qualification is a boundless confidence in my need for money which is a need anyone can depend on me to have reliably and at all times. My ideal job is wandering at my own pace and to no set purpose through an evacuated landscape. My greatest failure is that I'm filling out your questionnaire. The qualities I look for in a boss are difficulty in keeping track of things, forgetfulness, indecision, leniency, generosity, having a benign awareness deficiency, gullibility, and non-punctuality. I feel most satisfied when I head home at the end of the day. Why should you hire me? It would mean you could stop looking for someone to hire. I mean, seriously, who hasn't wanted to say these things in a job interview before? If you haven't felt this way at least once in your life, I'd encourage you to pull that silver spoon out of your mouth and look at your own reflection in it. Now, jokes aside, this scene may appear at first as simple wish fulfillment, but I think it actually quite accurately reflects the cultural temperature today with how we view work and remuneration. There's a growing movement online, simply known as anti-work, which exists mainly on Reddit and acts as a sort of digital town square for workers across the world to air their grievances about their job, their pay, their benefits, or lack thereof, and so on. If you spend a few minutes scrolling through that sub, you'll find hosts of just infuriating text exchanges between workers and their bosses, as well as various horror stories from people at their jobs as early as the first interview. When reading this first In For Questioning sequence, I kept being drawn back again and again from Super Aesop to the discussions that I've seen in the anti-work forum. As a movement, 
I think they're poorly named. They're less concerned about abolishing work altogether as they are with bringing to the public eye an awareness that our current working conditions are simply unsustainable in the long term. This concern with unsustainability in the status quo is reflected all throughout the novel, and Michael actually agreed with me on this. He said the movement is pretty much just good old proletariat class consciousness in a new iteration. The preterite versus the elect, a culture war that has never ceased, resolved, only changed shape as one generation passes into the next. Our current anxiety about the diseased state of capitalism is baked into the surreal absurdity of animal money. And it's that fantastic element that makes it something you actually want to read. If Sisko had chosen to approach the story as a straightforward social revolt tale, it would have looked like so many of the other novels that we've read before. But that's not his M.O. He has a very particular theme and atmosphere that he's interested in exploring. Decay, delirium, some kind of altered monasticism. I'm looking for ways to invert what seem to me to be common sense notions about things so that I would be looking for a way to make decay or delirium affirmative. Damn right he made it affirmative. The sheer depth of animal money surrealism and descent into narrative chaos makes it unlike anything else I've ever read. But that's not going to stop me from trying to make comparisons. Cisco is something of a convenient pivot from my last video as he and Krasnohorkai share a lot of the same influences. In an interview with Adam Mills from the Weird Fiction Review, Sisko has cited Kafka and Beckett as two of his most formative influences. He's also unreservedly claimed that Burroughs taught him how to write. If I were to editorialize on that a bit, I'd say it's probably the soft machine Burroughs rather than the naked lunch Burroughs. But I digress. He's described his creative philosophy as an intent to create living monsters that will go out into the world and wreak havoc on readers. Well, Michael, consider your mission accomplished because Animal Money has lost me more than a few nights sleep. This novel, along with pretty much the entirety of Sisko's work, has been consigned to the category of weird fiction. I'm guilty of doing so myself in the front half of this video. In reflecting on that, I think I think I'm doing Michael a bit of a disservice by feeding into this idea of a dichotomy, a false dichotomy. This separation between genre fiction and literary fiction, as if they're mutually exclusive elements. I think the further that we progress as a culture into a nuanced understanding of art, philosophy, sociology, identity, we get more and more comfortable with discarding binaries in favor of spectrums. When grappling with a medium as complex and as versatile as fiction, it seems like a pointless exercise to try and fit everything into neat little boxes, or to borrow James Wood's words, approved units and packets. In a 2015 interview with Word Horde, Sisko was asked, what do you think the role of genre is in regard to fiction today? I found his answer really quite compelling. Genre is a memory image that gathers together a local microcanon around a given piece of writing. Reading just about anything, you will see how it repeats settings, phrasings, movement through plot points, and so on from other writings. This isn't necessarily copying though. Where there's just copying, there really isn't new writing there. Just another older story, poorly recollected. The writing is new, not just in what influences it combines, but also that it connects with ideas and impulses from earlier works and extends them. So genre is the landscape a piece of writing uses, but it's also an orientation. I think this answer provides a good entry point if you're going to draw comparisons between Sisko and other authors. If I were to take a crack at such comparisons, here are the two I think I would have a best shot at doing so. Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon and 2666 by Roberto Bolaño. I've mentioned Gravity's Rainbow a couple of times now, and I think that's fairly obvious, given that it was in searching for books like this that I actually found Animal Money in the first place. It is possible that this comparison is colored by the way that it came to the book, but I still think there's a case to be made for it. Even the most disoriented reader will come out of Gravity's Rainbow with a few clear takeaways. It's narrated by a wide variety of characters, its timeline is frustratingly complex and non-chronological. It's structurally circular. And most importantly, the novel completely collapses in on itself by the end of the book. 
every single one of these features can be applied directly to animal money, which is in part why I responded to it so strongly. Although I find narrative entropy to be exceedingly frustrating when it's used for no particular reason, here I think it serves a thematic functional purpose just like it did in Gravity's Rainbow. I don't see Cisco as having used this technique purely out of reference to Pynchon, but having done it for the exact reasons that he stated before. The writing is new not just in what influences it combines, but in that it connects with ideas and impulses from earlier works and extends them. So genre is just the landscape a piece of writing uses, and it's also an orientation. This fractured, dissolving plot structure is used, at least in part, to reflect the devastation that the Second World War raked on the Eastern European psyche. I see Sisko as taking this concept and drawing it forward a generation or two by showing us what the GFC did to the American mind. It's not pastiche. It's just the next stage in an idea's evolution. So what about Bolaño? That's an easy one to pick up on straight from the jump. Latin American setting, five academics meet up to discuss a shared interest. Sounds an awful lot like the opening to 2666. I probed Michael about this, and he did say that Bolaño was one of his many Latin American influences, as well as his desire to write a doorstopper like 2666. But the influences and similarities go deeper than just the setup of the novel. 2666 is really an omnibus of five separate stories that are interconnected through various characters and plot points, but each of which could stand alone as its own separate story. While Animal Money isn't separated into neat little episodes, the part about the crimes, the part about fate, etc., it does contain several interwoven stories that could be unspooled and written into their own standalone novels. The book opens, as I said, with five economists coming together, creating Animal Money, and releasing it into the global markets. But that's really just the setup. There's an entirely different story running through it about a physicist named Asaya Malakos who discovers a form of propulsion that's used in the development of interstellar travel and her journey to other planets as the result. There's also the story about Super Aesop as he tries to smuggle a traumatized journalist over the border. There's a thread about a writer who plays host to this parasitic louse in his tongue who whispers in the ears of politicians and affects the political power plays that go on in San Torbio. This list goes on. Stories nested within stories nested within stories. This is in part what feeds into the complexity that I keep referring to here. The story you start with in 2666 is not the story you end with, and the exact same thing happens here in Animal Money. But the book isn't just the mind meld between these two. It's so much more than that. These two were just the ones I had on the front of mind when I was reading it. You can see the confluence of so many different influences here. Burroughs, Kafka, Borges, Ligotti, Vandermeer. What makes this such a fresh read is that it doesn't resemble anything else. It's entirely a melting pot of various genres and narrative concerns. Given the many ideas he's playing with in the book, I find this cross-pollination of different influences to just be fascinating in the way that he employs it. So I had to dig into the bowels of some weird lit message boards for this one. At BizarroCon in 2015, Cisco shared the story of how the absolutely batshit insane cover for this book came about. Michael was struggling to communicate to Cameron Pierce, who was originally supposed to do the cover art for the novel, what he had in mind. Through the weird and wonderful rabbit holes of the internet, Michael came across the portfolio of the Canadian artist Matt Brown. He found his piece entitled Our Anthropic History, which perfectly conveyed the atmosphere that he was going for. Perversity, surrealism, weird beauty, and a sense of the world like ours, but not quite. He sent that image to Cameron with the note, something like this. Rather than try to produce an original image in pastiche of Brown's work, Pierce simply contacted Brown and gained the rights to the original painting, Our Anthropic History. That became the stunning wraparound cover that I get the pleasure of looking at every day. This, along with the entirety of Brown's portfolio, is just a stunning work of art. While physical dinosaurs and disassociated central nervous systems aren't literal presences in the novel, this cover so perfectly conveys the overstimulating, disorienting, psychedelic spirit that infuses every page of the book. 
I love the bold decision to leave blurbs and testimonials off the cover entirely and just let the imagery speak for itself. I'd be lying if I said the cover wasn't instrumental in me picking up the book in the first place. For my money, it's one of the best I've come across. Thank you so much to Matt for allowing me to use this photo for the video. For all its conceptual high-mindedness and abstract concepts, I see Animal Money as an intrinsically human story. If there was one character who I was truly wired into while reading this fractured, multi-layered story, it's undoubtedly Super Aesop. Although the leading third of the book is centered almost exclusively around the five economists as they create animal money and release it into the financial markets, the closing third of the book becomes focalized through the eyes of Super Aesop as he feels its effects. These economists instigate the inciting action of the book, but after that point they really just sit back and observe its effects. These five professors begin to fade into obscurity as the consequences of their decision begin to take shape. Aesop is something of a labor revolutionary, who throughout the book is constantly fighting for better working conditions for entry-level workers. Yet despite all his efforts, the capitalistic status quo is a very slow-moving machine. This is the outcome of some of his efforts. An attempt to form a pizza delivery person's union. Failed. An attempt to form a motor pool for delivery persons. Failed. Two attempts to require pizzerias to cover fuel expenses for delivery persons. Failed. An attempt to prevent the dismissal of a pizza delivery person who was murderously assaulted and hospitalized by a mentally disturbed customer. Failed. And so on. An object at rest stays at rest. The capitalistic power structures make sure of that. He fails because he's operating on their terms, under their conditions. But he also realizes his necessity is a ground-level worker. Under the smooth, sneering finish, they're afraid of us. Not of me or you, but of a nebulous people they have spent their lives escaping from, pretending not to belong to. They can't stand on the balcony gazing out at a silent whip nation with TV lights in the windows, sigh with satisfaction and say, they bought it. From out of the dark comes a sound of sirens, breaking glass, a plume of smoke, a lot of angry voices shouting, there's trouble, there's lying to be done. And that takes time and money. Those flavorless, tranquilizing TV haircuts don't cut themselves. So it was worth it after all, like before. Not worth everything, not worth nothing. We set the value, not them. Again, this was written in 2015, but this is what I refer to when I say it reflects a contemporary mindset. The members of the anti-work movement are waking up to the realization that they actually wield an extraordinary amount of power so long as they choose to coordinate it. Without us, deliveries don't get made, factories don't run, roads don't get repaired. So why is it that allegedly the most essential among us are paid the least and treated the worst? If I may wax lyrical for a moment, as someone who worked as an essential worker throughout the entirety of this pandemic, I could not give less of a shit about your clapping or your thanks. Pay me, insure me, give me benefits, give me PPE. That's all I care about. That's all he cares about. Aesop is the viewpoint through which all these frustrations and anxieties are focalized. A simple pizza delivery driver who, in ways that I won't fully spoil, ends up having a massive impact on the plot by the end. And there's another factor to consider here. I mentioned at the top that this is set in the fictional city of San Torbio. That's an interesting and intentional choice for a name. Torbio Romo Gonzalez was a Mexican priest who was martyred in the late 1920s in the Cristero War for his clerical beliefs. He's also the patron saint of immigrants, which is principally why Michael chose him as the namesake for the city. It's no accident that this story is set in a city populated largely by migrants and refugees. And it's no accident that Aesop identifies as a black man. Because when a major societal upheaval takes place, whether it be fantastical, like the creation of a living currency, or grounded, like an international housing crisis, who bears the brunt of that blow? Immigrants, people of color, and poor people. We saw it during the recession, we saw it during the GFC, and now we're watching it happen during the pandemic. This cyclical nature of poverty and social disenfranchisement. This is why I suspect Cisco chose to structure the book in a circular fashion. 
Do you remember that job interview sequence I mentioned earlier? The in for questioning section. That's the first encounter we have with Super Aesop when he is asked, why did you leave your last job? In the closing pages of the book, Super Aesop is shot and killed in the crossfire of an attempted political assassination. And as he's passing away, this is the passage that unfolds. You cannot take refuge in God. We can and we will drag you back from God's protecting embrace and put you to the question. Death will not save you from interrogations anymore. Screams of the dead, faint in the night. They have your dead mother, your dead friend in there. You'll talk. Now then, why did you leave your last job? These cycles of economic impoverishment and corporate exploitation just continue over and over again from generation to generation. I mean, seriously, just two months ago, a group of workers were killed in an Amazon warehouse because their supervisors refused to let them go home during a fucking tornado. So don't sit there and tell me that these essential workers aren't just a number and a dollar sign to you. That's the cost the human cost of constant economic growth. Is it worth it? Near the beginning of this video, I mentioned the epigraph that reads, that bird is free, you owe me a bird. I sat on this for ages, trying to wrap my head around why it was used. I even tried probing Michael about it, but he gave me nothing. So I'm truly flying blind here. That epigraph is a line attributed to the Zen Buddhist Shunryo Suzuki Roshi, who popularized Zen Buddhism in the United States in the 60s. Interestingly, of the four prominent Buddhist teachers who brought the practice to the US, Suzuki Roshi was the only one not to be embroiled in a public sex scandal. Does that have any relevance to this video? Probably not, but I thought it was an interesting tidbit. After some digging, I came to learn that this line is actually the punchline, if you will, to a longer proverb, which I'll read to you now. A student confronted his master in his study and asked him, How can you teach people to speak spiritual freedom when you keep your pet bird in a cage? The master opened the cage door and the bird flew out the window, never to be seen again. The master turned to the student and said, That bird is now free. You owe me a bird. This is what's known in Zen Buddhism as a koan, a story, a dialogue, a question used to provoke doubt in the person who it's presented to in order to assess their progress on the path to enlightenment. And a koan never has a clear answer, only a wide expanse of personal interpretations. So let me offer you mine. I think this gets to the heart of what Cisco aimed to do in Animal Money. Create a space for us to question the intrinsic value of currency and our changing attitudes toward it, for better and for worse. There's a scene near the end where Super Aesop is no longer engaging with the narrative, but actually speaking outward, directly to the reader. What is money? Social human power made numb and separate, amputated under anesthesia. You'll feel all that pain later, though, without knowing what it is. End money. Why let others decide how your social power, your time, your work will be unitized and stored up? Why not make your own money? Why not make your own society? What choice do you really have? Bank is a symbol of fear. End money. End money by making it. It's all counterfeit, that stuff you use. End money. It didn't come from you. It is you taken away from you by somebody else, fed back to you in drips and drabs and drabber every day. Money is not a means of exchange. Money is a means of preventing exchange. Look at the country where the greatest volume of money is circulating. Those societies are frozen. There is relentless change, but there is no difference. Everyone is bound by the enchantment of the money spell, cast by the most pedestrian magicians the world has ever seen. That bird is free. You owe me a bird. What is freedom? And what are its limits? What confines it? What confines us? By defining freedom, we restrict it to the confines of its own definition. We lock it in a cage. Money is a defining, limiting force in our life that we believe can lead to, but paradoxically also restrict us from freedom. And much like money, words are treacherous. If you remove the boundaries to a word, the constraints that give it a definition, you lose the meaning of that word. That bird is free. 
but it's gone. Bars of a cage, value of currency, the meaning of words, constructs, every last one of them. Money is, at its most foundational level, a collective agreement that only functions so long as everyone buys into it, pun intended. This thing that traps so many of us in debt, poverty, and social repression, it can only do that so long as we all agree to buy into it. We're only trapped as long as we allow ourselves to be. Money, work, capitalism, they're constructs, not forces of nature. Now, I'm not suggesting we upend our entire economic structure, the one which our countries are built upon. I would only do so if I had a clear alternative in mind, which I don't. I'll leave that to people smarter than me. I'm simply saying that we need to be allowed the space to host a discussion, much like Michael is doing here, that what we've invested ourselves in so heavily is not sustainable. At some point, whether it be five years or 50 years or 500 from now, we will have to re-examine our economic systems and find a new way to function. And I don't know what that'll look like. Maybe the abolishment of currency altogether, or maybe the creation of a new living form of currency. But until then, I don't think we can be entirely free. The silver lining in the meantime is that we have bold, provocative writers like Michael Sisko who are taking the time to examine these big ideas to fascinating and above all entertaining effect. So if you want a big book that examines some big questions but gives you a riotous narrative to examine them in, then look no further than Animal Money. Okay, once again we made it. If you made it this far, once again, I am incredibly grateful for you sticking around. Now seriously, go on a walk or something. This has been way too long already. All the secondary resources, which were frustratingly few, I might add, you can find in the description box below, as well as the text version of today's episode on Substack. If you wanna buy animal money for yourself, there's pretty much only one place you can get it right now, and that's Amazon. So if you are thinking about doing so, I'd encourage you to use the link that I've put below. You'll be supporting the show in the process. Uh, I've got a few review copies that I need to get through, which I'll probably just be posting about on Instagram, but I am aiming to get my next video out in the next couple of weeks. I've actually already chosen the book for it. You can see it somewhere in here. Hint, hint. And, uh, yep, that's it. <laughs>